uh, view of how we look at Agadus and Midrashim. And uh, after uh, yesterday's uh, shear, uh, someone asked a very good question, and I, I'm not sure I have a complete answer. Uh, as you already know, uh, we find Agada and Medrash in several places. We find a lot of it in the Gemara, and even the, there are a few Mishnayas that are Agadic, and then we find the bulk of it in the books that we call Midrashim, Medrash Rabbah, Medrash Tanchuma. Now the rabbis who are in these Midrashim are the same rabbis who are the Tanoim and Amoraim. Uh, so obviously some of their teachings found their way in the Gemara, and some, or the Mishnah even, and some of their teachings are not in the Gemara or the Mishnah, they are only in the Medrash. Now all of these are from Chazal, no question about it, but it is brought down that the stuff that made it in the Gemara has a certain higher level of Chashivas than the stuff that didn't make it in the Gemara. And by and large, the written Midrashim are after the Gemara. They are actually compilations later than the Gemara itself. So the question becomes, it's an interesting question, like what decided the reason why some Agadic teachings are considered to be perhaps, perhaps of a higher Madrega that made it in the Gemara and other Agadic teachings remained Balpe, it remained oral until they were written down in the Midrashim. What determined it? Now again, all of them are Chazal. All of them are, we accept as MS, either literally or symbolically, whatever your definition of MS is. But it is a good question, like what made the Gemara, what did not. And I do want to add another thing in the opposite direction. It is brought down that we know that originally the Torah Shabbat Peh was not allowed to be written down. Right? The Torah Shabbat Peh had to be orally transmitted, and it was only at a time when there was a risk of it being forgotten that the Chachamim permitted the writing down of Torah Shabbat Peh, and they quoted the Pasuk in Tehillim, E Slasei Slashem, when it's a time to stand up for God, hey, favor Torah Sacha, you're permitted to annul the Torah. You can break the rule against writing down the oral law in order to preserve it. Now, this is a very dangerous Pasuk. This is a nuclear Pasuk because uh, anybody could say anything. Oh, you know, uh, I'm going to tell people they can drive to Shoal. I mean, this is exactly what conservative reform movements say. Uh, they don't quote the Pasuk, but essentially they're saying, oh, I want, you know, for God we can do anything. Obviously, this can only be used only by the greatest, greatest of the Gedolim who see an extraordinary danger to Klau Yisrael unless they allow it. And this is not a Pusuk we can just pull out on our own. Uh, but be it as it may, uh, there was an Isser against the writing down of Torah Shabal Peh. And then it became Mutar because of Eis Lasai Slashem a Feirut Torah Secha, when it's a time to stand up for God, the Torah can sometimes be annulled, or to put it another way that the Chachamim express it, Bitula Zuhi Kiyuma, nullifying the Torah in this particular instance is a way of ensuring the survivability of the Torah, and because of this, the Torah Shavopeh is written down today. Yeah? If the system of the Torah is perfect and dictated by Hashem, and why should any changes or betela be necessary at all? Well, uh, you know, you can ask this in a lot of things. For example, let, let's take an area that's not, doesn't involve nullifying the Torah. Let's take the issue of gezeros, right? The gezeros, halacha is full of gezeros. The chachamim say, don't eat chicken and milk because maybe you will cross the, uh, the borderline and uh, eat meat and milk, right? Uh, so the question becomes, uh, if this is a true gezeira, why was it not folded into the perfection of the Torah? It's as if you're saying the Torah is imperfect by not making that point. So there actually is a notion that Hashem to some degree left the Torah in a partially incomplete state because he wants the Chachamim to kind of fill things in. That was part of the divine plan. And therefore, HaKadosh Baruch Hu wanted the Chachamim to even be able to abrogate rules. You know, we don't blow shofar when Rosh Hashanah falls out on Shabbos, lest you carry, even though they're taking away a mitzvah. There too, that's a small example of actually violating the Torah in order to secure a greater benefit. It goes back to the idea that Hashem wants the Chachamim to be part of the creation. Of, of Torah. Now the reason I'm bringing this up now though is it's mashma from a number of Gemaras 
that the prohibition against writing the Torah Shabal Peh did not apply to Agada. It only applied to Halacha. And even before the Mishnah was written, there were Chachamim that had notebooks of Agadita that they preserved. So, in a way, it's a paradox. Because if you, if you ask me, when were the Midrashim written down as books? They were written down after the Gemara, interestingly enough. But halachically, they actually could have been, could have been written down even first. Because we find that the Yisra of Teresh Peh was never chal. It never was in effect on, on Agadita. But th that's a little controversial because some people say that the Agada writings were only private notebooks and private notebooks were permitted even in Halacha. So it's not a chilik between Agada and Halacha. It's a chilik between private and, and public. The Rambam writes that even in the days of Moshe Rabbeinu, People took notes. <laughs> People took notes regarding what Moshe was teaching. So the idea of, of not writing Torah Shabal Peh meant you didn't teach it publicly from a book, but individual people were always allowed to make notes. And some explained that that is the meaning of the Agada. Now, they tell a story. You know, the Hassam Seifer, Rav Moshe Seifer, was one of the greatest Achronim, lived around 250 years ago. And the Chassam Seifer had a Rebbe who's less known, but the Chassam Seifer is made what a Gadol he is. So if the Chassam Seifer says his Rebbe was a phenomenal Gadol, he must have been that way. And this is Rav Nassan Adler. Rav Nassan Adler lived in Frankfurt, and he was the Rebbe of the Chassam Seifer who grew up in Frankfurt. The Chassam Seifer then moved to Pressburg, and that's where he was the Rav, but the Chassam Seifer was a child of Frankfurt. Rav Nassim Adler was a very, very unusual man. He was a very independent man. Uh, a tremendous, tremendous guy in Atsum, but he was independent. He marched, so to speak, to the beat of his own drum. For example, he pronounced Hebrew as a Svardi, and he dove in Svardic, although Frankfurt is the, you know, the height of Ashkenazi country, uh, but he felt that Svardic pronunciation was better, and that's what he followed. The Chassam Seifer did not imitate his Rebbe in that way, but, but uh, this is noted. Be it as it may, though, one of the reasons we don't know a lot about Rav Nassim Adler is he never wrote anything. There are no Svarim. Like, that's a general problem. There are quite a few G'daylim who were in their generation were very, very famous and very makubal and very accepted that we know not, almost know nothing about today because the way we know about Gedolim is primarily by the writing that they left. If they didn't leave writing, so they did so much in their lives, but you know, we don't know about them, right? So there are Gedolim who simply we don't know a lot about because they didn't leave any writing. Rav Nassim Adler is one of them, uh, but the story goes that in all of his Svarim, there are filled, there are filled with periods, with dots. Next to every word, there's a dot here, and a dot here, and a dot here, and a dot here. And the story goes that Rav Nassim Adler said the following. This is a very schwer story. He said that really you're not allowed to write Tarish Abalpeh, but the Chachamim permitted it because it was in danger of being forgotten. Rav Nassim Adler says, since I never forget anything, I'm not allowed to write down Tarish Abalpeh because I don't forget anything. So all I can do is I can put a, a, a period, I can put a dot on every word in which I have a chiddish or something, and then I'll remember what it is. So he held that he was not allowed to write down Torah Shabal Peh because there was no danger of shikha. This is, I, you know, I, I don't know if the story is true and I'm not sure it is at all, but this is a very, I mean, I mean in, in some ways this is an illogical story because the issue of not forgetting is not about you, it's about the world, about the Jewish world. So, in fact, that's exactly what happened. We don't have Rav Nassim Adler's Torah because it wasn't written down. So to make a cheshpin that, because I'm not going to forget, I'm not allowed to write down, is the chayre, not a svara. The hetyer of Esau's Hashem is to preserve it for posterity and not just uh, for, your, for yourself. I and mean, we have come of a kama gedalim that had uh, what you might call almost photographic memories, if not photographic memories. I mean, the Vilna Gaon, the Rugged Shover, right? And they still, you know, wrote down uh, what, they, what they wrote down for Klal Yisrael. Okay, so that's one point. That, so the point I wanted to bring out is the interesting point that some Shita say that on Agada there never was an Isser. 
of Kesivas Torah Shabal Pat. It only applied to the realm of Halacha. Uh, another point I, I wanted to share with you before we move on to the next uh, Indian is this notion of Agada having a symbolic meaning. Rabbi Salanter in the 19th century gave a beautiful, beautiful mushal to kind of illustrate how Chazal talk in Agada. It's really a beautiful mushal. You know, he lived uh, in 19th century Russia. 19th century Russia was the Tsar. This is before the Communist Revolution in 1917. And uh, I'm not going to say there were good Tsars and bad Tsars. All the Tsars were bad, but there were bad Tsars and worse Tsars. Meaning to say, <laughs> some Tsars were much, much worse. Some Tsars were bad, but they weren't extremely bad. Uh, well, I shouldn't even say that. They were all were extremely bad, but some were extremely, <laughs> extremely bad, and some were just... So if you only had an extremely bad czar, uh, Hashem was giving you a great, great bracha, uh, bracha for that tekufa. Uh, but Rabbi Sol lived, at least in his younger years, under one of the most oppressive of the czars. Uh, in fact, uh, there were things called the Cantonists, which is a mamish, 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 a tragedy in Jewish history, in which uh, the Tsar ordered that Jewish children from age eight and up be forcibly drafted into the Tsar's army, and they would have to be there for 30 years. Now, uh, in the Tsar's army, there was no Shabbos, there was no Kashrus, uh, there was no nothing, and there was a great pressure to forcibly convert to uh, the Christian faith of Russia, which was the Greek, Greek Orthodox uh, Church. And uh, they were taken for 30 years, 30 years. Uh, most of them either died or became Goyim and got, you know, that's it. There was a group of them, groups of them, that for 30 years they remained separated from their parents, taken as little children. They remained faithful to Hashem. And even 30 years does come to an end. And some of these kids, 30 years later, got out of the army. Well, that sounds like amazing to get out of jail after 50 years or whatever it is. But you could imagine that most of these guys were crazy. I mean, they were not, they were not balanced. I mean, look at the life they had to live for 30 years. So it was tragic. There are books about this. They, they couldn't live in a regular Jewish community afterwards because they could only live with people like them that they went through. So they had like villages. I'm not going to say they were Haredi from like, you know, like Yeshiva. I mean, but they kept, they kept Shabbos, they kept kosher, but they were, they were kind of crazy. And they had their own place that nobody else could understand them. And sometimes Rabbanim would visit to, to give them chizuk. Mamish, I mean, there's poems and songs uh, from this tekufa that very, very sad songs that describe these are called the Cantonists. Now, what, what was even worse is, this is Radir Ravi uh youth in his adolescence and his younger years. It stopped uh, when he got older, the change of czar. What was worse is that the Russian government made the Jews get involved. For example, they would tell the Jews, the Jewish leadership of a community, you have to deliver to us 20 kids. A village might have 20 kids, a city might have 100 kids. And what happened was that rich people, influential people, would bribe to get their kid excused and they would chop a poor kid. And there are kama vakama maisim. I mean, you may have heard these stories, but now you know the historical background a little bit. In which, in fact, they say it by Rios Oslantra himself, uh, other gadolim as well, that uh, a poor kid was kidnapped there were, these were called choppers. They were professional Jewish kidnappers. They would just grab a kid off the street, even though he was exempt. Because, you know, you may say, well, why was he exempt? Because there were different rules. If you were the only child in a family, uh, you were exempt. But the choppers would kidnap these only children so that the rich guy would get off the hook. You see what was going on here. So these were Jewish people doing this. So there are kama vakama maisim that like before Kol Nidra, he saw Salanter stopped the davening. And he said, we are not going to go on unless we raise the money to ransom this child. Again, because bribes could work for the poor kid as well. 
And this happened more than once. This is a, a tragedy on top of a tragedy. There's a tragedy in the kids being taken. And there's a tragedy in the survivors who were crazy, even though they were tzaddikim gemurim, who were Moser nefesh, but they had no way of living. They couldn't get married. They had no way of living a normal life after what they went through. And then you have a tragedy of the Jewish people themselves who were so broken that they were involved in kidnapping and, and taking these children of poor families. Life was very, very dangerous for a Jew under the czars. So another oppression, which actually is not so bad, but it was pretty bad as well, is Jews were not allowed to live in most areas of Russia. They were confined to certain areas, and this was called the Pale of Settlement. Jews were allowed to live in the Pale of Settlement. And if you wanted to go to Moscow or Petersburg, you had to have special papers, and you had to apply, and you weren't allowed you know, to go in, stum, and the like. Now, one of the problems with the Pale of Settlement is that every few months, every few years, sometimes every few weeks, they would just change the boundaries. So you could wake up one morning and there would be some sign that's nailed to the door that says, all Jews must vacate this area within 48 hours and move 10 kilometers to the west. All of a sudden it's arbitrary, no reason at all. No reason at all. So with this background, here's a marshal Rabbi Sos Lancher once said about Agadita. Let's imagine that you had 100,000 Jews located in the Pale of Settlement. And one day, the Tsar's representative orders that 100,000 Jews relocate, leave their homes within 24 hours, and move 100 miles to the east. Now let's imagine you're a journalist, you're a reporter, and you have a punchy, vivid style. So you write a newspaper headline that says the following. With a drop of ink from the Tsar's pen, 100,000 people drowned. That's what the headline says. Let's imagine, 100 years later, an archaeologist finds a newspaper from, you know, 1850. And the newspaper says, a drop of ink from the Tsar's pen drowned, took out the lives of 100,000 people. So you're going to read that headline and you're going to say, what type of ridiculous Bubba Mice is this? Is the Tsar a giant? He has a pen that a drop of ink could drown 100,000 people? Are they midgets? And you might say, these people, whoever believe this story, either are superstitious or they're on drugs or they're alcohol, alcoholics. Of course, for Russia in those days, uh, that, that, that indeed would be a possibility. He says, this is a stupid story that nobody could believe. But if you understood what was going on, that the Tsar signed a proclamation, and that destroyed the lives of 100,000 people, poetically and vividly it's being expressed, a drop of ink drowned 100,000 people. You see what a powerful, vivid, metaphorical way it is to express an idea. So Rishos Lanter said, that is the Lashon of Agadita. Agadita will say things like, a drop of ink, no drowned. Uh, look in Rabbi Barbar Khan, there's Agadita is about giants and this and that. He says, really it's meaning that, which means, this is another aspect, besides the philosophical ideas of Agadita, a lot of things depend on the history as well, meaning Chazal are referring to certain events and they're describing certain events in certain ways using poetic, poetic language, just like this newspaper article would be a, uh, even a journalistic example of this. So history is actually, so, so besides philosophy, symbolism, which of course is the Iker tool we have for Agatha, history is also an important thing. Uh, you know, the Gemara is, is of course not, just like the Chumash, the Gemara is not a history book, that's for sure. And indeed there are many, many events that are not really described by Arichos in the Gemara. The Bar Kokhba revolt, for example, 
which was a traumatic tragedy for Am Yisrael, is barely described in the Gemara. Herod murdering, I mean, it's a reference, Herod murdered, but all of the atrocities of Herod, which could fill a book, are maybe, you know, ten lines in the whole Gemara. Because the Gemara's attitude was, we don't have to focus on Soros, we'll focus on Ruchnius, we'll focus on Kedusha, we'll focus on Torah, and you know, the world is going crazy, but we don't have to talk about how crazy the world is. But rest assured, Chazal lived in a crazy world. Chazal lived in a world that was turbulent in many, many different ways. And they didn't want to dwell upon it because they didn't always see a Tayelis in going over all of that. So what interested Josephus and the like did not always interest Chazal. So they tended to create what you might call a spiritual world within the turbulence of a world falling apart. But they do allude, they are marames to historical events. And they'll sometimes do it like Rivera Salandra's example in the poetic language of Agatha. So this is yet another aspect of it. And that is, besides the symbolic spiritual truth of Agatha, it's also a way of conveying historical truths in a certain way, which is why it's sometimes could die to kind of look at Josephus or look at historical books and then try to figure out uh, what Chazal are, are referring to in any given situation. Yeah. I'm not sure if it's accurate enough, but I heard the, the Rashba uh, took more of a, like, I don't know if the literal interpretation or somewhere between the Rambam and, and like, the other, other Rishonim. Um, were there other Rishonim who, who didn't, I guess, agree to the exact principles? I mean, who are some of, somewhere, somewhere between the Rambam and the other Rishonim? Well, the Rashba is actually an example. The Rashba, of course, wrote Chidushim on many Masechtas, but in addition to the Chidusha HaRashba and Masechtas, which are on Halacha, they're not on Agada, the Rashba did write a separate work, a separate Sefer on selected Agadata. I think it's called the Chidusha HaGada Al HaRashba. Uh, now, in the Yen Yaakovs, you know, you'll notice in the Yen Yaakovs, uh, every few pages, there may be something called HaRashba, that is taken from, from that larger book. But most of it can be seen in the Ein Yaakov's itself. Um, I believe that Kemad, everything of the Rashi was only on Brachos. The Agadita is, is only on Brachos, so maybe he wanted to do more, but, but he didn't, uh, didn't get past uh, Brachos. Uh, but you'll see, the Rashi does seem to have more of a literalist bent, but he also brings in Kabbalah, which the Rambam does, does not do. So, uh, so Kabbalistically, uh, you also move away from literal, but in a different way. Uh, there is an article, I could make it, uh, it's, it's online, uh, it's written by, oh yeah, 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 I don't remember his name, but it's, it's, it's like a hundred pages on how the Rishainim viewed Agatha. So he gives you like every, literally every Rishan who ever wrote an Agatha, uh, you can get it. It's, it's in the journal Chakira. And if you know, Chakira is the uh, journal published in Flatbush, it has many, many interesting articles. And um, I can't I remember his name. He teaches uh, here in Yerushalayim. Uh, but he go, he, you can mamish get, uh, you know, uh, there is no, like, like there's nothing anybody could add on it. I mean, he went through every single Rishon uh, with quotations so you can see all of the different Mahalchim on Agarita. Okay? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Kabbalah generally is a symbolic genre, so Kabbalah turned everything into symbols. Uh, Rachel and Leah are symbols in Kabbalah, although they existed as persons. So uh, Kabbalah Bechlal is, is symbolic thinking. Okay, so, all right. Now, the question is this. The question is, I just want to remind you of contextually, why is the Rambam talking about this now? What does this have to do with the subject? Remember, this is a hakdama to... For us, what is the 11th parak of Sanhedrin? In the Rambam's gear, it's the 10th parak of Sanhedrin. Parak Chelek discusses who has a share in Olam Haba and who does not have a share in Olam Haba. So the Rambam wants to discuss what is Olam Haba. That, that's really what he wants to discuss. So why, if he is devoted to explaining what is Olam Haba, why does he go into this very interesting digression as to what is Agada and Medrash and how you understand it. Like what is the connection to the overall goal of this discussion? 
Well, the answer is very, very simple. The Rambam is trying to answer questions you would otherwise have. Because in the Agados and Midrashim of Olam Haba, about Olam Haba, whether they're in the Gemara or whether they're in the Medrash, that makes no difference. Olam Haba is described as a very physical place. We talk about the meals you're going to have, the meat and the fish. We talk about the tables, the golden tables. We talk about rivers of wine that will be going by you. Uh, we talk about the ability to recline on beds of ivory with gold canopies. So Olam Haba is described in a very physical, gashmiastic way. Now, the Rambam is going to go to great lengths to show you that Olam Haba is not physical. It's not material. So the question becomes, but how could he say that? That's contradicting all the Mamari Chazal. So you see what the Rambam is doing. He's, he's kind of smart here. What he's doing is, before he will de-physicalize Olam Haba, he needs to tell you, don't ask me questions from all of those Midrashim, because those Midrashim themselves are not meant to be understood literally. They are metaphors for deeper ideas. You see, this is absolutely essential for what the Rambam's trying to do, because if you go with group one that we talked about yesterday, the group that believes that Agados have to be meant literally. You're not going to be able to say Olam Abba is spiritual because a literal reading of the Agadita is Olam Abba is physical. So the understanding of how you look at Agada is central to the Rambam's ability to de-physicalize Olam Abba, which is the main purpose of what he's trying to do in the Hakdama to Perik Chelek. Yeah. Does that mean a Rishon that does believe that uh, lots of all, or all uh, Haggadahs are literal would have to hold that Olam Abba is, does contain as much as yeah, Yes, I mean, I mean, yes. If you, if you take the position, which the Rambam called Group 1, of the Kat, the Group 1 that says, everything Chazal say must be taken literally, then when it says you're going to eat the wild ox and the Leviathan, I am going to eat the wild ox and the Leviathan, right? Uh, you are committed. You can't have it both ways. You can't say Chazal are literal, but I don't believe in a physical Olam Abba. That's not possible. Chazal's Midrashim describe a physical Olam Abba. I mentioned to you the poem that we recite on Shavuos morning, which was written later, but it's based on these Midrashim. And this is Akdomos. Right, Akdomos, thank you. Akdomos is an Aramaic poem that was written a little before Rashi's time. And uh, it's the Hakdama, the introduction to the receiving of the Torah. A beautiful poem, very, very hard because it's pure Aramaic. Like there's no Hebrew, it's 100% Aramaic. So, you know, you don't get any help from the Hebrew words that the Gemara sometimes puts in. Uh, but it's a very beautiful poem, unfortunately, because we read it after we've been up all night. Uh, people are often falling asleep during Akdamas, uh, but it's Kedai to read. Uh, but one of the things Akdamas does is, it is a very vivid description of the joys and the pleasures of Olam Haba described in the physical Mishalim that Chazal use. Banquets, eating, drinking, lounging. Now, that doesn't mean that he thought it was literal. Maybe he also thought it was symbolic, but at least if you want to get a sense of the physical descriptions, Akdamos might be a good place to look. And in fact, take any art scroll sitter, uh, and it has Akdamos, and it has at least a, at least a translation. There is an art scroll commentary in Akdamos too, but even the translation will show you what is being, what is being described. Okay, so this digression about Agatha, which is a very important digression, is actually central to what the Rambam is now going to try to do and talk about the idea of Olam Haba, the world to come. And uh, the Rambam says it is true that the Ikar reward that Hashem gives us for mitzvos is Olam Haba. But the Rambam says, Olam Haba is not physical. There is no eating, there is no drinking, there is no uh, sexual intercourse, there is no gold, there is no silver. 
because, and the reason is very simple, Olam Haba does not have a goof. There is no goof. Your physical body does not go to Olam Haba. Your physical body is in the grave until such time as resurrection, which we'll get to. But Olam Haba is not resurrection of the dead. Olam Haba is where a soul goes now. In fact, that's what the Rambam points out. He says, Olam Haba, the world to come, this is an interesting semantic thing, doesn't mean a world that will come. Olam Haba exists right now. The only reason it's called Olam Haba is you're not in it yet until you die. You see the difference? In other words, Olam Haba does not mean a world that will be created in the future. Olam Haba is a present reality, but we are not there yet. We are in transition. Like Pirkei Avos describes, this world is a hallway, a prosdor, to Olam Haba, which is the Traklin. Traklin is the palace. And the obvious advice for us is, Hasken atzmecha beprosdor kidei shetikanes letraklin. Perkyavos. What does that mean? Prepare yourself in the hallway so when you meet the king in the palace, you look presentable. Right? Let's say you know, you're going to meet the president, right? So you're outside the Oval Office or whatever the office here is called, and you, you know, straighten out your jacket, whatever it is, you know, clean yourself up in the hallway before you go to the palace. That's what life is about. This life is a tracklin for the pro, I'm sorry, this life is a prose door, hallway, for the tracklin of Olam Haba. So Olam Haba, the body is discarded. The body is like a coat, an overcoat. Take off the coat and your real self goes to Olam Haba. And therefore the Rambam says, since a neshama, or nefesh, we're not going into that now, different parts of the neshama, that's another Rambam, but whatever it is, your spiritual essence has no physicality, there's no eating, there's no drinking, uh, there's no sexual intercourse, so obviously it wouldn't be possible for Olam Haba to have any of those physical things, but the pleasure and the tainug, tainug is the joy, of Olam Haba is the closeness that you have to Hashem. The notion of your neshama returning to its source. The source of our neshama was the breath of Hashem. And when Hashem breathed the neshama into the guf, we, we, we suffered a separation from HaKadosh Baruch. And now we are united. And the Rambam says that is a pleasure that a physical human being cannot fully understand. Because we only know pleasures in terms of physical. Uh, and therefore, Chazal used big physical pleasures. So you'll, fi so you'll understand that Olam Haba is so good, is so great. But it's a magnitude that is beyond our ability to comprehend, uh, both in terms of the quant quality and in terms of the quantity, because it never stops. In fact, people point out, it's interesting, that Hashem's punishments are generally limited. Like, you know, you don't go to Gehenim for more than 12 months, etc. But once you get Olam Haba, that's forever. So Olam Haba is wonderful. And every person who does a mitzvah gets Olam Haba, generally. We'll talk about who loses it. That's the other part of the Rambam. But the intensity of Olam Haba depends on how righteous you are. So, an average Jew, whatever that means, will have Olam Haba, and that's going to be wonderful. A tzaddik Jew has a greater Olam Haba, right? And uh, that's even better. So we, can de we determine by our deeds, by our behaviors, by our mitzvos, by our averos, how much, how much meaning, how intense will the pleasures be of Olam Haba. And that's all Olam Haba is, meaning it is the world of Ruchnius. It is the world of connection to Hashem. There is no physicality. And any physical description of Olam Haba is just a metaphor or a mashal to underscore the pleasure of that connection to Hashem. And then the Rambam makes the point, it's interesting, he contradicts himself a little bit. Because after he says, we don't understand spiritual pleasures, he then says, 
On some level, though, we understand that spiritual pleasures are greater than physical. He gives an example of people who are willing to risk their lives because of love of family, love of children. Think about this. In other words, uh, a person is willing to give up their wealth. They're willing to give up their lives because they love their children. I mean, there's something in their life that's greater than physical pleasure. Even abstract ideas, which may or may not make sense. Patriotism. I give up my life for my country. I give up my life for my people. Where is the pleasure in that? Like, there's no ple I mean, the pleasure is a spiritual pleasure, that you want to be connected to something beyond yourself. And the Rambam says, if people are willing to give up money, health, freedom, and life for these other ideas, you do see that a spiritual ideal, sometimes even an evil spiritual ideal, can have a bigger power over a person than physical pleasure. And the Rambam says that kind of teaches us a little bit about Olam Haba being greater than physical. Okay, so this is a point one. The Rambam will talk about Mashiach and Tchiyas Amesim. Remember, we have to talk about those things. But Olam Haba, the Chala Pachot, is, um, is spiritual. It's, in fact, the synonym for the Rambam of Olam Haba is Olam Hanishamos. It is the world of the Nishama. There is no guf in Olam Haba. Okay? And, and according to that, therefore, Olam Haba does not mean a world that will be coming. It's an entity that exists right now. It's where your neshama goes after there's a certain position in Gehenna. Now, what's the role of Gehenna exactly? Hell, right? So... The Rambam doesn't fully address it. Uh, he, he just says Gehenna is a fire, etc. He, does, he doesn't really explain it fully. But the most logical way of perceiving Gehenna, and this will not be explain everything, is Gehenna is like intensive spiritual therapy to prepare you to receive Olam Haba. Because a person does Averos. Their neshama is damaged. Now, they may have done many, many mitzvahs, too. But because the neshama is damaged, they're not capable of a union with Hashem. So Gehenim is a spiritual purging process where the neshama gets repaired. And that's very painful. The fire of Gehenim is also a metaphor. The fire of Gehenim. I go through all that I've done. I relive it. I experience it. I get repaired. And the Rambam says, after Gehenna is Olam Haba. The Rambam, in fact, says, even if a person is a Russia, he'll go to Gehenna. After Gehenna, he will go to Olam Haba for his mitzvahs. Other than those who lose Olam Haba. We'll talk about that. But the Rambam says, just because a person's a Russia, he might be Machalo Shabbos, he doesn't keep kosher, he didn't keep mitzvahs. He will get Olam Abba because he was a nice guy, he gave charity, unless he qualifies for those who don't have a share, which we haven't gotten, gotten to yet. The fact that you have many more Averis than mitzvahs, that does not disqualify you from Olam Abba. You'll get Olam Abba for your mitzvahs and, and, and the like. So the most logical idea of Gehenna is it actually is a chesed of Hashem to give you the therapy that we need in order to go to Olam Haba. I don't know if any of you ever had to have uh, extreme physical therapy, let, let, but God forbid somebody breaks, you know, you break your legs or whatever it is. So you got to learn to walk again. And, you know, I've, I've seen cases like this. You know, the person is screaming, the person is begging not to do these exercises. And, you know, you have mercy on them. You, you, you want to let, let them off, I go back to bed. But no, you got to say, you got to do it. You got to do it. You got to do it. This is the only way. I mean, uh, tragically, our own Rosh Hashiva is, is actually going through this process right now. I don't know if you know how seriously injured uh, Rev Schiller is, and we should be Ms. Paolo for him. But, but essentially, uh, he is having, having to go through the process I just described. 
So in that way, Gehenim is actually a rachamim of Hashem. Because it basically says that even if your soul is so damaged that right now you're not capable of connecting to God, we'll fix you up. We'll fix you up. And then you'll be connected to God. But it's going to hurt. Okay. I mean, you can compare it to what goes on. Where things get tricky, and I'm not, I'm not going to have to be able to talk about this today, is, okay, I understand when there's temporary Gehenim followed by Olam Haba that the Gehenim is the therapy. But is there such a thing, in Judaism at least, as eternal damnation? Is there such a thing as a Russia who burns in hell forever? Obviously Christianity obviously says there is. And there are Chazals that do talk about certain Rishayim as burning forever. But the real question is, what's the point of that? Meaning to say, what does God get out of eternal damnation? I could understand obliteration much more. I could understand HaKadosh Baruch Hu saying, this Neshama is so damaged I can't fix it. So it would seem to me logical I'm not thinking out loud here because these are questions that bother me. Sometimes people ask me, are there any questions that bother me? This is actually one of the questions that, that bothers me. I can understand obliteration as being part of what Hashem does. And Hashem might be so broken, Hashem says, can't fix it. Okay, so can't fix it just means, all right, I throw it away. But what's the point of eternally torturing somebody? I mean, that sounds, God forbid, I mean, we can't question God's ways. But that sounds sadistic. Where regular Gehenim is not sadistic. Regular Gehenim is therapeutic because it repairs you. But eternal damnation has no therapeutic value. So even if you're going to say, well, he goes to Gehenim because he's unfixable. Okay, so unfixable seems to me that annihilation should be the logical response uh, to not fixable as opposed to you know eternal torture so one question we're going to think about is is there such a thing as eternal damnation and what would be the cheshbein for it so right now we'll leave it as a question but for most purposes Gehenim does have a duration and therefore it can be understood as a chesed of Hashem that Gehenim is the therapy that enables the Rasha to have some type of olam haba because of the good that the person has has done. Okay? Yeah. Um, if 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 olam haba is an important part of your part to against our theology, and like every like different styles talking about like how this door this door is a closed door to the next world. Yeah. So why didn't uh, Torah mention anything of it? Like, yeah, that 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 is an excellent question. Uh, as we know. When the Torah talks about rewards explicitly, the Torah always talks about this world. You know, you'll have children, you'll have health, you'll have parnasa, you'll be wealthy. The Torah does not say, I mean, it alludes, there, there are hints, there are hints to be sure. I'm not saying it, it's not mentioned at all, but it's very, very uh, oblique. It's not, it's not clear, and it's certainly, there are not a lot of references to it and the like. Why does the Torah de-emphasize uh, the idea of Olam Haba? Uh, the Rishayim talk about, if you, if you look at the, the Kli Yokor, uh, the beginning of Bechukosa, he has a long, long, he, has like, he gives ten reasons why the Torah does not discuss Olam Haba. Part of it is that people don't understand it, so it's not going to motivate them. Since they don't understand it, Hashem wants to give us motivators. You know, you'll get rich. You know, that I, I can understand, etc. Uh, and that's one reason that it's not a motivator. Uh, the other reason is that in an interesting way, Olam Haba can sometimes be an excuse for not trying to make this world better. Let me give you an example of this from American history. You know, um, if you, when the blacks were slaves before the Civil War, so there were a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of music, Negro spirituals they were called, right? These are like songs that the slaves composed to get them through their difficult life. And uh, these songs were composed with the encouragement of the slave owners. And a lot of the, the songs are about the world to come, meaning this life is miserable, but there's the world to come in which, you know. And the slave owners liked that because that meant that the slaves felt, you know, we don't have to change things in this world because there's going to be a paradise. 
Meaning, olam haba can sometimes be an excuse not to help the poor, not to make society better, because ah, you know, God will take care of it in the world to come. And the Torah wants to create an orientation where a Jew looks at injustice and suffering in this world and wants to do something about it. And therefore, you almost have to be a shtikal apikoros. There is no olam haba. Of course, there is. Because I got to help the poor person right now. So it's a way of creating a greater proactivity in helping people in need and not simply say, ah, oh, Hashem will take care of you, you know, in olam haba. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> if uh, olam haba is like a completely non-physical realm, yeah. then how could people like Eliyahu Anabi or Rishub and Levi enter with their body? Yeah, well, that's, that's an amazing thing. And uh, once again, <laughs> there, is, there is a notion that you become so holy that the body itself becomes spiritualized. That's a, a very unique thing. Only two people uh, and the like. Yeah. So if Olam Abba is this complete, amazing connection with God, yeah. wouldn't Tchias Amazing be another separation? Of right, so we'll, we'll talk about that. That's correct. In other words, you may be wondering, so what's the, what's the great deal about Tchias Amazing? I'm better off uh, without the body. Why, why, do I need, <laughs> why do I need the body at all? Well, we'll talk about that. That's a very good question. Yeah. Where does the concept of uh, Yim Kulim come into? Where does what didn't hear you? The concept of Gilgulim. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, all right, so Gilgulim is an idea that's very, very important among the Makubalim. The Rambam does never mentions Gilgal at all. And Rav Sadja Gaon mentions Gilgal and says it's wrong. It's Treif, and it came from another religion. So in the Rambam's lexicon, there is no Gilgal. But, but uh, if you accept the Makubalim, Rav Chaim Vital and the Arizal about Gilgal, uh, it works uh, very well because all that means is that, that's a big thing, your, your neshama will eventually go to Olam Abba, but, uh, but only when you are mistaken it by repetitive lives in this world. So you may have to come back several times before you, your neshama has uh, rectified itself, and then you go to Olam Abba. So Olam Abba is the destination, but you may have to go through Gilgulim before you get to that destination. Now, it's interesting. Uh, so Gilgal might be a substitute for Gehenna. In fact, in some sources, the idea is when a person dies, they're given a choice. You, know, you have Pagamim. Do you want to go to Gehenna? Or do you want to just come back here and try it a second time? By the way, it's brought down in Sforim. When the Neshama is given the choice, it chooses Gehenna. <laughs> I'd rather go to Gehenna than come back here again, right? So in a sense, this life is even worth, worse than Gehenna, right? So in that, in that way. Okay, well, continue to take care. Thank you.